And good morning, everybody. A happy, happy Sunday to you. I do hope everything is going your way and everything is fine in your neck of the woods. This is the portion of the show where we sit here behind this graphic and let the YouTube notifications go out, letting everybody know that we are live. If you're watching this on replay, go ahead and just scrub past this graphic. I'm waiting for the clock in the other room to finish letting everybody in the house know that it's 12 noon. Then I'll reach over here and click a little button and say, Hey, y'all, happy Sunday to you. Hope everybody is doing well. Hope uh, you got a little bit of shop time in this morning. And uh, everything is good. Uh, see, this morning, the video, which was almost but kind of not quite unplanned, went live. Um, a little bit more in depth about DXF files. I did not mean for that video to be that long. It was almost an hour. Holy cow. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you should have seen what I went through to close caption that sucker, but that's another story for another day. Anyway, um, a few things, a little bit of behind the scenes and a little bit of, uh, housekeeping to do. Um, it was already asked in the, um, in the live chat here, uh, an update about Dave Gatton's health. Um, I wasn't at liberty to really describe everything that went on because Dave is, you know, he's a private person and he doesn't, uh, like to, um, put out a bunch of stuff to the public. He likes to keep that to himself. Well, he has told me it's okay if I tell folks. Uh, he, on April 16th, had a massive heart attack and was rushed to the hospital. Um, he almost, the ambulance came and everything, and he almost turned down treatment. Then it started hitting him again. So he, they took him into the hospital. He had 100% uh, blockage uh, on one, um, I don't remember which one it was, but uh, at about 70% on the other three. So they went ahead and they did a quadruple bypass on the man on um, that Monday. And um, he went through the surgery just swimmingly. He is at home. Uh, he is doing very, very well. Um, in fact, he's doing better than I ever would have expected him to do. I mean, he, obviously he's not up to a hundred percent, but he's at least at 75%, if not better. Uh, he is doing extremely well. So all the good wishes, all the prayers, uh, have worked for him. Keep him going. He's still got a long road to hoe, but uh, he says he feels better than he has in a long time, all things considered. I mean, they still had, to, as he said, he's got an eight inch long zipper in his chest. So it's, uh, it's still, he's got some recuperation to do, but uh, he's doing very, very, very well. So um, that was the update on that and um all your good wishes and all your prayers are very much appreciated let me just say that um another little behind the scenes thing we have uh going today happened this morning yeah about two hours ago i took delivery of my flooring for the shop shed so there should be a shop shed update coming soon uh the flooring is here the uh, insulation is still out of stock, so I'm still waiting on that. Uh, these, the two plants that make the chemicals that make up the polyurethane foam uh, are back online. I don't know at what capacity, 
but they've got a lot of catching up to do. I mean, they went down in February with those storms down south, the Arctic storms that knocked out the infrastructure, so I'm still waiting on that. But I did get the flooring this morning about two hours ago, so um, that, that should be my next update. So, uh, let's see, ignore any noise you hear in the background. We've got a little bit of construction going on across the street from me around the cul-de-sac. He's uh, grading and graveling a driveway. So, <laughs> so if you hear a bunch of machinery back there, there's nothing I can do to, uh, there's nothing I can do to stop that. So, sorry about that. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and get into the questions. We had some great questions about the video this morning. Um, let me first jump over to the comments on the video itself. There were a couple of comments um, as soon as I can find them. Oh boy, where did they go? Let's see. Um, come on, Mark. Where are they? Comments. There we go. All right. Let's see here. Uh, Anton Studahar, I believe. Uh, if the fit-to-curve tool only acts on multi-noded curved segments, why the need to individually select the letters in need of attention? Shouldn't you be able to just select everything with no harm done to the areas needing improvement, uh, needing no improvement? Um, and that's a good question. It's a valid question. The yes, it only does the it 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 only affects the amount of nodes in the uh, more complex in the curves, the more complex curves in the uh, design, but it also will convert those straight lines to Beziers, which, I mean, it won't hurt anything, but um, it, it it's just not really necessary, so I didn't do it. Plus, the point of the video was to show its effect. If you let me let me go ahead and bring one up here. Let me uh, kind of caught me on a, unaware here. I should have. Whoops. No, it's not what I meant to do. Uh, let's see here. There we go. That's the one that I needed to do. And. I'll go over here and do this. I used to know what I was doing. Make sure I'm screen sharing and I am. Okay. If you notice when we selected the number three, for instance, and we went into the curve fit tool, the keep sharp corners max angle that kept these as a straight line. It, it did not convert them to Bezier curves. Now, there is nothing stopping you, and it won't hurt to just select all of the text. And let's go ahead and do that. Select all the text, go into Curve Fit, and we see what we have right now. If I click on Preview, it didn't change these at all. And it didn't change these at all as well. So you could go ahead and uh, select all of the text. Or all of the vectors for that matter. But it doesn't really matter. And the purpose of the video was to show what happens with curves. So yeah, I could have gone ahead and box selected the whole thing. But, like I say, for my demonstration, the whole purpose was to show you what happens with curves. So, that's why I didn't do that. But, yes, you could. It, it just very easily, you could go ahead and, uh, and, and select all of the vectors if you wish. 
So I hope that answered that one. And let's see, there was another one here. Um, let me get back up here and find it. Okay, Joe of Wood Studio IA says, Having never been involved in CAD with CAD software before, I'm confused on the different file formats and the advantages and disadvantages of each, or does it even matter? No, it doesn't matter. And I'll get into that more in just a second. Let's say I have a full-size blueprint and go to a copy service to scan for me. What file format do I ask for? What ones are better than others? And are there ones to avoid? Thanks and see you at noon. Well, hello, Joe. Um, the different file formats that are created in um, the different CAD programs are, are basically their proprietary, their native formats. Now, um, it doesn't really... It doesn't really matter what that format is. The, um, the standard has been for a long time. Uh, AutoCAD uses its native format as a DWG file. And there are, a, there are a couple of other CAD programs that use DWG files. But that is AutoCAD's native format. The only thing that means, it, it's kind of like a word processor file. If you use OpenOffice, it's going to save a ODT file. That's just a file that that program reads with all of its formatting in place and any macros that you have created applied to the document and what have you. Um, so a DWG file made for AutoCAD can be read in some other programs, but probably not up to its optimum. Uh, and that's where the DXF file came in. It was originally intended that the DXF would be a way for uh, draftsmen or architects to take a drawing they had created in one version and share it with people who may be using other versions. Or indeed other software titles because at the time there weren't many titles out there you had like AutoCAD, TurboCAD and there were a couple of others but the DXF and that's what DXF stands for is drawing exchange format the DXF was created as a way for people to share amongst versions because you got to remember Back in the day, there was no monthly subscription service. This came out long before the internet went public. So these programs like AutoCAD, depending upon how many licenses you bought, what size company you were working with or firm you were with, some of these had five-digit price tags. So it was extremely expensive to just upgrade to the latest version. And Autodesk understood that. So they tried to help everybody out that they could. And so the DXF file was born. As to which is better, um, if you can get a, and you're talking specifically about taking a full-size blueprint to a, uh, a copy place to get scanned, so long as it's a vector drawing that gets scanned, if, I mean, if they can scan it to a DXF, or a DWG, or something of that nature, then you're golden. Um, you can even import vectors from a PDF depending upon how the PDF file was created. If it was created as a vector drawing, then you can import vectors straight off of a PDF file. If it was created as a JPEG snapshot, then it's just going to be another bitmap trace. But if you have a full-size blueprint, talk to, I don't know in your area if you have building exchanges or uh, print shops that specialize in large format blueprint creation or copying. 
uh, they can scan into a format that will uh, pull it off into vectors. So, I mean, it, it's you're going to pay for the service. It's not like running down to Kinko's and, you know, having a photocopy run off. But, you know, even some Kinko's can do it. Not all of them, though. But um, as for which is best, anything that will give you a vector drawing is uh is perfectly fine but do expect to do some cleanup in aspire v carve cut 2d whichever so the really sometimes there really isn't the best and as far as the different formats are concerned they're just proprietary formats just the same as like i said uh libra office or open office will save an odt file and microsoft word will save a doc file or a docx file they're both the same printed result. It's just each program reads something different. So, so I think that was the only questions on the comments. Uh, no, I all Peleg has another one here. A um, little bit off topic, but that's fine. Does your CNC controller support G5? Yes, it does. I use Mach 3. Um, I think my... GRBL CNC machine does not support it. Um, if not, then wouldn't the Bezier curves, which are great in compact description, yes, get converted back into short lines? It might. But I've not run across a controller that doesn't support uh, G5. So I don't know. Maybe you need, uh, I don't know if you have the uh, latest uh, release um of your controller maybe there was an update i i really don't know i don't know anything about uh the grbl gerbil gerbil whatever you want to call it i don't know anything about those controllers but i've not run across a controller that doesn't support uh g5 so um and also it has to do with the post processor as well so um it Post, different post processors handle the Arxis JK and all the other good stuff a little bit differently. So it, it's hard to answer that question simply because I'm not really familiar with the, the Gerbil controller. Mach 3 has no problem with it at all. I mean, it just whizzes through. It doesn't matter what you throw at it. It'll take it. So, uh, but other than that, Maybe somebody in the chat can help you out with that because I know absolutely nothing about the uh, Gerbil um, controller. So let me zip down here and little let me see what's going on. Okay, yeah. Um, let me get back up to questions here. Uh, Norm Peterson said, uh, I did your video on level clipping with the horses. Works fine until I try to set the zero point anywhere other than center. The file moves to that corner. How do I move it back to the center of the workpiece? Yeah, you will have to do a bunch of realignment. When I, I do these uh, videos basically for demonstration purposes until I get the shop shed back up and running. So if I'm going to carve something in 3D uh, or anything at all for that matter, I go ahead and I will set up with my XYZ zero uh, set in the center. And then before I go over and calculate tool paths, I'll switch over to the bottom left corner because that's where I set it. And then I will come back out of the tool pass tab over into the drawing tab. And sometimes there is some realignment you have to do and just have to get in. And that may include drawing some guides or what have you. It's not very often that that happens. But occasionally, if it's a real complex design, I will have to kind of go back in and realign things. 99 times out of 100, though, I don't have to do that. It just depends on what I'm doing. So, 
you won't have to get in and change any of the combined modes or um, any tilts or fades or anything, but you may have to realign things because the models themselves won't jump around, but the level clipping will. So just take level clipping off, make sure that you've got your vector correctly spaced, then apply level clipping again and everything should work out. So, let's see. Um, yeah, folks talking about Michael Mazalik's video that's coming up. Uh, there is a link to it in the description box of this video. And um, it looks like it's going to be pretty killer. Uh, importing and exporting 3D models. Uh, I'll be there. I'll be watching. So, let's see. Um, let's see here. Rick French says, uh, I see the challenge in making the single tile with only the V carved border without a profile cutout is being that the material needs to be perfectly square to the X and Y axis. Yes. And that's why I have my little alignment jig. I have, um, I'll put a link to that video in the description after this has, after we've finished live here. Well, I made a little alignment jig that slips into my T-track and butts up against the front edge of my uh, CNC table, which I know is squared up with my uh, X-axis travel. And I clamp it down, put my piece of material in place up against it, then I mount the material. Clamp down or tape down or whatever I'm doing with the material. So it is aligned with the x-axis travel. And then I use my three-way touch plate to set my XYZ zero, and I'm off and running. So yes, you do need to make sure that your material is aligned. Uh, also, you could do another, create another rectangle the same size as your material and cut it out, do a different profile cutout. But um, that was done just to demonstrate that you have several different options using all of the same vectors. So, but yes, it does need to be squared to the material. So let's see. Uh, he also says in the larger tile pattern are the vectors between the tiles cutting twice because they are doubled up. Yes. Is this a problem? No. And in fact, a dirty little secret, if you want to save, depending upon how much time the carve takes, if you want to save yourself a bunch of cleanup time, I run my V-carve files twice. I'll run the tool path twice. So it'll finish cutting and lift up, move back over to zero. I just hit cycle start again and it runs it a second time and goes through and cleans up. And um, I always get a better result that way. It does not hurt anything that they're cutting twice. It, uh, if anything, you'll notice that uh, those grooves in between the tiles will be cleaner than the ones that didn't run twice. So, <laughs> so let's see. Yeah, I I double cut almost everything. So Okay, suicidal at all times. I was wondering if there was a difference in the output code when using circles or bezier or does either output as arcs J and K? Um the circles, yes, that's what they will. Circles use arcs unless you change them to Bezier's. And that was my point between the Bezier curve and the arcs in the video. And I had mentioned it before in another video, but I don't remember which one. Arcs work off of a known radius. They are rigid. You have a start point, a stop point, and a radius uh, based off of uh, an imaginary center point. So the only way to change that arc is to change that radius. Whereas a Bezier curve, you have those handles that you can get in and twist and turn and manipulate. So you have more control over a Bezier than you do an arc. 
And when you get down to the G code and how the controller is going to respond to it, uh, it's going to use, as we were talking earlier, G3 or G5 commands, whichever. And that tells the controller which of these it's cutting. And it, each controller and each post processor is going to handle it in a different way. So, let's see. But then again, I have not seen a controller that doesn't support G5. Now, I may be wrong. There may be several out there that doesn't support G5. So, uh, let's see. Okay, Steve Russell says, I have an off-the-wall question that has nothing to do with today's video. Send it away, my friend. Go ahead. That's what we're here for. Um, let's see... Hopefully my audio is doing okay. Um, Roberto Lagas, what CNC machine works best with SolidWorks software for G-codes and other stuff? I use SolidWorks to draft designs. That's all down to the post-processor. And, you know, which machine works best? I mean how much money you got you know what it, it's just like building hot rods speed costs money how fast do you want to go i mean so i've seen people use solid works on homemade machines that have um used mach 3 controllers and i've seen people use solid works with multi-million dollar machines big thermwoods um um uh, online buddy of mine works for Boeing and uh, they have a big thermwood machine that will print out huge panels. It'll 3D print on one gantry out of ABS. Then that gantry moves out of the way and the five axis CNC comes over to it and machines it down to spec. I mean, uh, speed costs money. How fast do you want to go? There isn't really a best machine it's all down to your post processor and um you know your budget so uh, now having said that i know several people who also model in solidworks export that model as an stl file then import that into vcarve or aspire and run it that way so I also know a couple folks who do that with uh, Fusion 360 because it's easier to uh, do the actual machining that way, or generate the G-code, rather. So let's see here. John Rumley, question. When would it be a time when you would put your zero position on the machine bed? Um, I think I answered this last week. There is no best. That's personal preference. Some people don't like to mark up their spoil board. So they will set everything, their Z0, off of the spoil board. And you have to tell uh, VCarve or Aspire that that's what you're doing. Otherwise, you can get yourself in a world of hurt. Bit lift up just not quite enough and run over the edge of your material and you're hosed, basically. So... They basically it's done for a few reasons. It's done to set an absolute zero so that when your machine cuts through the material, no matter how much variation the top surface may be, uh, it will cut all the way down to that zero and not concern itself with uh, a rough top surface. Personally, I don't baby my spoil board. I don't care if it gets chewed up. That's what it's for. And depending upon what I'm doing, a lot of times I have a second sacrificial board on top of it. Like if I do anything double-sided, I have a piece of plywood that I set up, fastened to my machine table, my, my other spoil board. And then I will drill my dowel holes in that piece of plywood and use that as my spoil board. So... Setting to the machine bed, some people prefer to do it because they don't want to mark up their spoil board 
and it doesn't care what the top surface of the material is like. It's going to cut all the way through to that zero. Personally, I don't care. So I set mine to the material surface. In fact, I've never set mine to the machine bed. I always go from the material surface. So that's the name of that tune. I uh, hope that answers your question. You can do it whenever you want. Let's see. Um, Jack Matson, super chat. Thank you very much, Jack. I really, really do appreciate that. You guys are the greatest, I'm telling you. You guys are great. Uh, let's see. Control F9 doesn't do anything in version 9. But select all F9 centers all as a group. Distance is kept. Yes. Um, no, control F9 doesn't do anything, uh, that I know of. You just tap F9. Uh-oh. Am I buffering? Yes, I am buffering. What's going on here? Um, I don't know what's happening. I do not know what's happening, and I can't change it. Huh. Well, this is not good. This is not good at all. Okay, Rick Underhill says, Have you ever used a Bondo filler to repair your spoil board? I haven't needed to yet, but that's what I would do. Ah, oh, man. Well, heck. Man, I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I'm sorry about the buffering, y'all. <clears throat> am I... Am I buffering? Am I really buffering all that much? Uh, I all says, uh, am I the only one with buffering issues? No, you are not. It's buffering on my end, too. I tell you, if it isn't one thing, it's another. I don't get it. I don't understand. I really do not understand. Ah, oh, man. And there's nothing I can do to fix it. It is within my uh, streaming software, I have a feeling. Okay. And I don't get it. Let's see. Let me try reducing my... If I reduce my resolution down to 480p, it works. Uh, Roberto Yagas... Thank you very, very much. Let's see. Uh, sending you guys a message. Uh, I apologize for this. I don't know what the devil's going on. This is one of those cases of Damn it, damn it, damn it. Uh, I don't know what's happening. You know, heartaches by the number. Uh, Roberto, thank you very, very much for your super chat. I really do appreciate that. You guys are the best. Uh, Brian, you can either use that uh, little dollar sign down at the bottom of the chat window or you can um, use one of the links down in the description box of this video. There are two links that will um, take you to a website that where you can donate if you choose to. I don't mention them much, but I do want to stop and take a moment and say thank you. Thank you very much to everybody who has hit those donation links. You guys, I mean, you con constant source of surprise. I really, really appreciate it. So, 
Um, yeah, I don't know uh, RB would work. I don't know if somebody's standing on my inter internet cable or not. You know, I've, uh, I'm paying for cable internet. You would think I wouldn't have these issues, but uh, evidently I do. So, um, and let's see, over here on my dashboard connection, it says, uh, hmm, yeah, poor, uh, stream health. Yeah, okay, we're back. Um, YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. I don't know where it gets that idea. So, <laughs> Issues, issues, and more issues. Okay, uh, let's see. I think I've got everybody's question. Um, suicidal at all times. Is there a double-sided tape or holding mechanism you like other than vacuum? Oh, brother, have I got a deal for you. Yes, I do. It is not my method. I stole it unashamedly from Ben Crow over at Crimson Guitars. And I use, believe it or not, blue painter's tape, 2P10 CA glue, and activator. I did a video on it about four years ago. It is my, mo five years ago, it is my most popular video ever. And I just wrote a note to myself to put a link to it down in the description box of this video. I put down, I mounted a piece of quarter inch thick material and purposely ran, let's see, what did I run? I ran uh, uh, surfacing tool paths, uh, surfacing tool path, profile tool path, pocket tool path, and V carved, I think a V carved tool path to show that it does hold and hold well. I've been using that mounting method almost exclusively since I made that video and it has never failed on me once, not once. Um, it works so well that um, John over at NYC CNC, John Saunders, the uh, machinist, he uses it on aluminum when they machine and um, it uh, it works very well it has never failed on me I despise double-sided tape for one reason I was I had uh, used double-sided tape to stick a template down on a guitar neck to route out the head stop Rick Underhill thank you very much my friend I do appreciate it. Another, another super chat. Y'all, y'all are killer. Thank you. Uh-oh, we're buffering again. Uh-oh. And I was routing with that template and the double-sided tape heated up just enough that the template moved. And when that template moved, that router bit gouged right straight into the uh, right straight into the area that I didn't want it cut. It ruined the headstock, ruined the neck. So I cussed double-sided tape up one side and down the other. And what I ended up doing at that point was mounting, figuring out where I was going to put my tuner holes on the headstock, and I actually screwed the template to the headstock because I didn't want to trust double-sided tape anymore. It just got too warm and it slipped. The problem with double-sided tape is you can burnish it down onto one surface, but then you pull the paper off, you can't burnish it down to the other surface. With using uh, painter's tape and CA glue, I can burnish this tape onto both surfaces. And then a thin line of CA on, down on the table, spray the uh, activator on the piece, get it positioned, and stick it down. And 30 seconds later, it's going. 
it's, you know, I'm ready to cut. It has never failed me, not once. It works for real thin, thin parts. Like if you're cutting something out of, for instance, for the 2017 Gatton CNC Challenge, I made a Christmas ornament and I was cutting 8th inch and 16th inch thick Baltic birch plywood that I got down at a little uh, RC radio controlled airplane shop, model shop. And it stuck down. I got all my cutting done and everything and then just peeled it right up and put it all together. Won't slip, won't ever have an issue. I refuse to buy double-sided tape. I use uh, tape and CA glue. And if the piece is too big, I'll screw it down. I don't mess with it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, teaspoon, Mark, you do an excellent job of explaining things in great detail. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I think I get way too pedantic and go too far. You know. Okay, Sonia Nawal. I'm a newbie, can't understand toolpath at all. Can you tell me a little on it? Okay, I don't understand the question. So what I'm going to suggest to you is, I don't know which software you're using. Um, I'm going to, but if you're using Vectric software, either VCarve or Aspire or Cut 2D, I'm going to suggest that you go down in the description box of this video and find the link to the Vectric for the Absolute Beginner series and start at step one and work your way up. I explain each of the tool paths. To put it in a nutshell, a tool path is just as it's described. It's literally the path the tool is going to follow to cut. Whether it be a carve into the material or a cut all the way through it. It's literally the path the tool is going to follow. You draw your design, get your vectors, then you assign a tool to that vector. What do I want to do? Do I want to cut this out? Then you'll use a profile toolpath to cut that out. Do you want to cut a pocket, just a recess? You will select that vector, assign a tool, and create a pocket toolpath. There are V-carving toolpaths. There are 3D toolpaths. There are, I mean, we could go on forever and ever and ever. It just depends on what you're trying to do. But in broad general terms, the toolpath is the literal ex actual path the tool is going to take to cut out or carve your project. So I hope that helps with that. I know it's not very specific, but without knowing exactly what you need. That's probably the best I can do. <laughs> so. Um, suicidal at all times. Yeah, that's it. Like I said, uh, about probably the biggest thing I have ever used it on. Well, I've used it to carve guitar necks. So, um, you know, if it'll work on uh, five-quarter maple, you know, it'll work on just about anything. But if it gets too big, I mean, almost everything I make, well, I won't say almost everything, but most of the things I make, they are um, about 16 inches wide and less than 12 inches tall. So for using the um, tape and CA glue, I'll put down three strips of tape, one in the center, one at the top, one at the bottom, and then do the same on the material, then glue those together. So I, it's so that it's supported because that bit puts downward pressure on it, no, a lot of downward pressure, but I want it supported at least in three places. And it's never failed me yet. So, you know, and it's easier to take off. It's, it's much easier to remove 
than um, double-sided tape is concerned. You know, and I've had a few people ask me, was it, but, you know, uh, masking tape is so easy to peel off. Yes, it's easy to lift off this way. Try pushing it off the side of the roll. It's got very good shear strength. So, you know, like I said, never failed me yet. Uh, yes, Sonia, if you are using uh, Aspire, then by all means, scroll down in the description of this video and you will find a link to Vectric for, what's it called? Let me look at it. I believe it's called Vectric for Absolute Beginner. Yes, Vectric for Absolute Beginners. And start with step one where I introduce basic navigation and then in step two I believe I start talking about the profile toolpath and that'll help you out so just know it is a learning curve and you know don't be afraid to ask questions because everybody started exactly where you are everybody and uh, Chris Coppinall is 100% correct. The great thing about a CNC router is it does exactly what you want it, exactly what you tell it to do. The bad thing about a CNC router is it does exactly what you tell it to do. So you got to kind of make sure <laughs> there's a fine line in there sometimes. Okay, it's been 45 minutes. Did I miss anybody's question? Um, did I have, did I miss anybody's question? Please let me know. Um, Rick Underhill asked, have I ever used a Bondo filler to repair my spoil board? No, I have not yet. But if I was going to repair it, that's exactly what I would do. If I had a large hole, I would glue in a uh, dowel and cut it off flush if I had a big gouge or something like that, Bondo it. I've used Bondo on a lot. So, let's see. Um, let me... Uh, I.L. Peleg says the post processor would have to conform with the limitations of the controller. Exactly. And some po post processors, especially if it's an older one, it may not conform 100% to that uh, controller because the controller may have new features that post processor doesn't access. So that's why I'm wondering. I, I, I really don't know about that uh, Gerbil controller system. Let's see. I hope everybody is going to be joining uh, Michael Mazalik this afternoon at, see, that would be 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. Over on his channel, there is a link in the description box of this video. So um, I hope to see everybody over there. Um, let's see, Steve Russell said he had an off-the-wall question that had nothing to do with today's video. Steve, did you ask that question? Um, I don't see it. Um, so I guess you haven't, not yet. So now is the time. Let's see, Chris Coppinall, is MDF the best spoil board? Sometimes there is no best. The main advantage of MDF is it's flat and it's relatively cheap. You can get it just about anywhere. So, um, it depends on what you're after. But I look at it this way. A lot of the big names in CNC manufacturer and production use MDF for their spoil boards. It's cheap, it's flat, it's easy to machine, and it does the job. And if you carve it up, you can repair it or replace it, and it doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. Having said that, some people prefer something else. So, um, I have an MDF spoil board, 
for that simple reason. It's cheap and um, it's easy to repair and it's easy to resurface. I mean, take a few thousandths off and it's done. It's ready to go. Okay, RB Woodwork says he had a question earlier. Let me go up and see if I can find it. Um, and we will... I don't see it yet. Uh, hi again from up I-5. I see that. And I don't see anything else. Um, nope, I do not see anything else. Do you, uh, if you wouldn't mind asking again. Let's see, Russell Faraday, my machine has a sign. Please ensure brain is correctly engaged before clicking cycle start. Yeah, yeah, that uh, checklists 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 i was in the army for nine years my first enlistment i was counterfire radar technician the most of my military career i was an aircraft mechanic you don't do anything without a checklist nothing without a checklist because nobody can remember everything at least nobody you'd want to talk to anyway um, and people have asked me to show copies of my checklist and everything. It's going to be different for every machine. That's why I don't get into it, but just take a, I mean, I'm an old fashioned kind of guy. I've got notepads all over the place, full of stuff. Take a notepad out with you and start with step one, you know, turn on the computer, turn on the, your controller software, turn on the machine. Get basic and fall and then use the checklist. More important than making the checklist, use the checklist. And um, if you follow that checklist, you can't go wrong. Nobody can remember everything. And as you're going through it and you're creating that checklist, if you need to add a note, add a note and include that in your checklist. So, okay, let's see. Dear Mr. Lindsay, um, how can I know what modifications to make when I notice white smoke while profiling solid wood? For reference, I'm profiling solid walnut, no problem, but for solid cedar, I see smoke. Uh, number one, how many flutes are on your tools, on your bits? I don't use, well, I can't say that anymore. I have a couple of three flute bits, but overwhelmingly I use two flute or single flute bits. I do not use four flute bits or above on my CNC at all. Uh, the reason for that is because depending upon the RPMs you have set on your spindle or router, there isn't enough time for the chip to get cleared and ejected from the cut before the next flute comes around and cut it again. So, um, that could be one thing. Also, check the rotation of your router slash spindle when it comes to the, um, the particular bit you're using. Not all bits are meant for clockwise or counterclockwise okay six millimeter down cut two flutes are you trying to drill do not drill with a down cut bit do not uh, other than that you may be moving see smoke is heat and heat is friction so something is going on there um Solid walnut, no problem, but for solid cedar, I see smoke. You're either going too slow or your RPM is too fast. So, um, and if you're drilling, do not drill with the downcut bit. 
use an up cut bit. Okay, uh, RB Woodwork, I see, okay, right after Suicidal Tape question, I'll get, I'll scroll up and find it. Um, ben Quick wants to know, what is your opinion on Vortex tools? They're pricey. That's my opinion. Uh, they are pricey. Um, now, having said that, I've never heard a bad thing about Vortex tools. Never heard a bad thing about them. Um, the, uh, I'm not brand loyal. So if, if I find a, if I find a bit that costs me $12 and the same bit from another seller is 35, I'm going to go with the $12 bit. Now, having said that, <laughs> sometimes you do have to go with the expensive bits. Like, for instance, a half-inch downcut spiral end mill is going to be pricey, whether it's a white side or a mana or vortex or onsrud, no matter who it is. You're going to spend some money on a big bit like this. That is something that I'm discovering about thread milling. In doing my research and looking into thread milling, it's expensive. Some of these bits are a couple of hundred dollars. So that's going to be a decider for me on how bad do I really want to learn how to thread wood. So um, RB Woodwork, I am looking for your question and I just do not see it. Um, other than somebody standing on my internet cable, that's the only thing. I just do not see it. Um, if you could just ask them, it looks like it didn't get posted because I sure don't see it. So, um, I'm going to, if you could save it for next week, RB, I'll get to it. I, uh, or put it in the comment section. Um, and I will get to it. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, and uh, Jake has a good question. It may be that bit is just dull. Um, let's see. Uh, last question I'll take, and then I'm going to have to wrap this up because I got to I got to get everything going here. Uh, I am new in CNC working. Any suggestions about buying files on the net? No, uh, I, I don't have any suggestions about buying files on the net. Um, just be careful. Um, there's a lot of um, unscrupulous individuals out there. If it looks too good to be true, it probably is. I would head over to... Uh, Depending upon the uh, software you're using, I would head over to Design and Make uh, for any 3D content. Uh, other than that, you know, I would love it if you bought my DXF files, but I'm not going to suggest that because it's just, um, it's entirely up to you. They're project specific. If you need them, you need them. If you don't, you don't. Uh, I generally speaking, don't buy files unless I have a project in mind that absolutely needs them. I just don't go shopping for files because there are so many out there that folks are giving away. And my priority is on learning how to use the software to design my own. I do understand instant gratification when you're new and you want to carve something, but you're not real sure on what to do. Um, but get into the software and the easiest thing of all is to just pick out a font you like and cut an address sign for your home. You don't even have to hang it up, whether you ever hang it up outside your house or not. Just pick out a font you like, get into your design software, make a little address sign, and that's a great first project or two or three. And you don't know what will happen. I mean, even if you, if you do hang it up outside you might end up with some sales. 
I mean, I know a guy who did exactly that. His first project was an address sign for his house. His neighbor that day came over and asked him, where'd you get that? I made it. Will you make me one? A week later, everybody on his cul-de-sac had them. So, you know, um, I don't have any websites that are my go-tos or anything like that. I try to draw everything myself. So, sorry. Okay, uh, I need to, sh I, whoa, I need to end this. We have been on for an hour. Holy cow. I want to say thank you again to the super chatters. You guys are, you know, Rick Underhill and Roberto Yagas and Jack Matson. You guys are all just, you know, the best viewers on YouTube, the best subscribers on YouTube. You guys just rock like crazy. Um, I hope you guys have a good week. Thank you to those people who have also gone down to those links in the description and hit those donate buttons. Again, you guys are just absolutely the best in the world. Next video, I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet. Um, I was thinking about, last week I said something about updating the, uh, what was I going to update? I was going to update uh, the circular array tool. There's no update to give. Um, I'll put a link to the video I did um, on it before. There is no update. So it would have been a waste of my time and yours. <laughs> so see you over at Michael Mazalik's video this afternoon at 2 Pacific, 5 Eastern. And until then... Go out and do something cool. Go make some chips. Get some shop time in. See you over on Michael's video. Y'all take care. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>